right, so last time we basically finished up one of the examples, uh, and that was the correct plot that is important in uh, viscosimeters that some of you will actually use in the lab as you go through. And we also outlined some special cases of the equation of motion. Um, I left the Bernoulli equation only as stated. And I'm actually going to quickly derive it after the topic we have here because we need concept of vorticity for it, or rather the fact that the flow is irrotational, and we're going to deal with that in our next lecture. So I'm just going to delay that a little uh, so that it makes a little more sense. And today we're actually going to embark on a sort of a longer topic, and that is solving flow around the scale. Okay? So for that, we will need to develop tools first. And those tools are actually called streamlined functions. So it's going to take a little to actually develop analytical tools in order to be able to solve the problem. And the basic reason why, as we will see, is that we will have a problem where I have two non-zero velocities that depend on two coordinates. So far, all of the problems that you have solved are the equation of one non-zero velocity, whether it's a quick flow, whether that's V theta, or it's a VZ in a two, okay, that depends on one coordinate, typically R in the examples that I just Okay. And that's something where we can basically, the partial differential equations that are governing uh, continuity in motion, uh, like mass conservation and motion, can be reduced to ordinary differential equations, and then I can actually solve them. Okay. So that's one of the key challenges, is when you actually have what we call coupled, sy coupled systems, where you have a dependence of multiple coordinates, and you have multiple uh, velocity components that are not zero. And that's what we are going to start on. So let's get started. I have posted, I think I posted all of the, I've been kind of backlogged, <laughs> not posting all the notes. I posted videos, but not notes. I think everything is now posted. Let me know if, some, if something is missing. And I also posted this PowerPoint. So I call it creeping flow around the sphere part one. This is the introductory part where we actually go over some definitions. So basically, why is flow around the sphere important? We have a lot of applications. In essence, you can um, think about sand grains. If I have a pack of sand, you can have simplification of it as a sphere. Okay? So it's flowing around spheres. So a sphere is a simple, simplest model of a sand grain or soil grain. Okay? So that's our basic models in porous media involve packing of spheres and basically analyzing them is analyzing flow around spheres, multiple spheres, of course. But we will analytically be able to analyze only flow around one sphere. Okay? Then you have particulate flows, so a lot of industrial fluids will have sand or silt or anything else within that they carry and basically understanding how does the fluid carry those uh, grains involves again flow around those grains, so I need to know what are the forces uh, that are acting on those grains. Propons are another thing, and that can be sand often, but it could be actually artificial. When it's artificial propon, then it's great, because it's typically a sphere, so it's easier to analyze, okay? And it's a known material, so we know the behavior. And if you're actually producing some of the sand uh, from the formations, so if you have unconsolidated or weakly consolidated sandstone during the production, you might get some of that sand, some of the formation out, and that's not what you want, you want the oil. So basically, in, a, in order to screen the sand screens, you actually have to understand how do you flow around those grains, so how can you actually prevent. So there is a lot of practical interest in uh, basically basic knowledge for flow around the sphere. So if I have a sphere, just like shown here, the very simplest setup okay, is that where I basically impose the z-direction, what I call a z-direction, okay? 
And I say, okay, there's this V infinity that is for velocity far away from the sphere, or rather, what would velocity be if the sphere wasn't there? Okay. And we assume, we assume a situation where if the sphere wasn't there, the velocity would just be like a constant V infinity in Z direction. Okay, that's it. So now if I place a sphere and I still have, and it's relatively slow flow, because if I have fast flow disturbances from the sphere will not necessarily be negligible. So if I have a small sphere, I place it, and then far away, now what is far away? I have to solve the problem first to find that. But far away from the sphere, essentially, you say, okay, far away from the sphere is your radius away from the sphere. The sphere being the center becomes infinity. Your velocity becomes this V infinity times uh, Z uh, Z direction uh, unit vector. Okay. So that is my essentially boundary uh, condition. And for this, we will actually need to know now spherical coordinate system because, well, we are flowing around the sphere, so it only makes sense. So just to remind you, if we need spherical coordinates, those are r, theta, and phi, uh, or that's one version of spherical coordinates that is uh, adopted by this book. So basically, if you have a point, this point, of course, you can look at as a point in x, y, z in, in Cartesian coordinates, but that point is also defined by its distance r to the center okay, of the coordinate system. Then if I project this point on x, y plane, then there is a angle phi, phi here that is corresponding to it, and there is also an angle theta here, okay, that, uh, that is between the z-axis and the actual vector to the point. Now, of course, you have some choices here, so technically this theta could be this vector, this phi could go the other way. Of course, you have to agree on what precise choices of these angles you're gonna, uh, you're gonna take, and these are the ones that we do. Okay. And then basically, we know that if we were just if we were just in x, uh, x, y plane, okay, then this length here, which is some radius and some function of theta, right, when I'm projecting here, okay, so this would be then the x, x and y are, are right here, so they depend as projection as this length, cosine phi and sine phi, right? So basically, then your x is r sine theta, which is this length here, okay? And then I project it on this axis, so that's times cosine phi. So this is your x. And then y is the same thing, uh, same length, r sine theta, just proje projected on the other axis, so it's sine, f, uh, sine phi. And your z is simply this r distance cosine theta. So this is just a quick reminder. Now, if you need any other changes, so you can take a look at the, this is a scan from appendix. You can see if you're taking partial derivatives, well, that isn't this a lot of fun, okay? So to relate partial derivative with respect to x to uh, theta, r, theta, and phi coordinates, this is the relationship. I'm not gonna read it out loud, okay? This relates partial, partial y to the, uh, the rest of it and so forth. Also, if you want to go back between the systems, okay, that's typically expressed as your delta r is this function of theta phi and uh, delta x, delta y, delta z, where these deltas are unit vectors in all systems. Okay? So we have to remind ourselves, if I am sitting on a sphere, Okay, then unit vector in phi direction will go around the sphere, right? So it will all point tangentially to the sphere in uh, this direction, sort of parallel to equator, okay? So latitude versus longitude, right? And then theta, okay, would point along the longitude, okay? So basically theta will point upwards, 
in the direction, uh, actually downwards in the direction in this uh, of theta increase. Okay, and r is always pointing in radial direction outwards. All three depend on the location. Okay. Also, as I'm moving out and further away, if I'm actually looking at the area or surface patch on the sphere, that patch is getting bigger and bigger and changes with r squared. We know that. Right? So you expect in all of your formulas, especially if they're looking for conservation, okay, to have this R square in there, okay, somewhere, somewhere show up, and that's because if you're looking at the flux, okay, and you have an element in the spherical coordinate system, one side of it has a smaller area than the other, okay, and that area depends on R square, so of course that will show up when you're actually trying to conserve flux through those areas. So no matter what, your flux will be, as your area is larger, and if you have constant flux, you will have less and less flux per area as you go up. Okay? So that's something to uh, have in mind. So, so basically, if you want to go, if you want to express delta r, delta uh, theta, delta phi, in terms of delta x, delta y, delta z, you can go this way. I like actually representing, so if these are my, just my coordinates, v r, v theta, v, v phi, then I can actually see that if I can isolate these coefficients here into a matrix and multiply them with the coordinates v x, v y, v z. So if I need coordinate change, I have a velocity v r, v theta, v phi, this same relationship will give me how it depends on bx, by bz, and if I need to go the other way, I use this relationship. We'll do that example in a second. And basically the, the matrices that are corresponding to this change of coordinates, right? Those ma matrices are so-called orthonormal matrices. So one is uh, the I think it's a, uh, it's a transpose of the other, and basically when I multiply them, I'm going to get an identity matrix. Okay. So we will assume a very, very slow flow. Okay, so we will have a laminar regime. There are no little eddies and vortices around the sphere that show up because of the regime. So my flow field will be sort of nice and symmetric around my axis, okay? So is, there's nothing here, no disturbances that I don't know how to represent uh, deterministically, okay? So I will actually have uh, dependence. So basically this cross section, if I have a sphere, the cr this cross section that I'm showing is the same no matter which phi I'm using, okay? So however I cut this, Sphere, this is my phi direction, okay, in x, y, right? this is phi. So however I cut my sphere through the center, I'm going to see this, yes? So basically I have symmetricity with respect to this z-axis and I don't expect phi dependence of my flow, okay? However, as I'm moving around the sphere, okay, I will have both part of vr and v theta velocity in order to get around the sphere, right? So in order, in order to get around the sphere, I have to have some of this v theta always showing up, and it's changing as I'm going around the sphere, okay? So both my vr and v theta will be non-zero. Otherwise, I can't get around the sphere. So basically, and that's part of it is because sphere is curved in two orthogonal directions. So cylinder is curved only in one direction, essentially, and it's straight in the orthogonal direction. And sphere has two non-zero curvatures, okay? So that's, in order to get around, I need a two-dimensional thing to describe that flow, okay? So this two-dimensional thing will be 2R, VR, and V theta that is helping me around. So I have VR. And both are dependent, so I don't have dependence on phi, but I have dependence on r and theta. 
So as I'm moving around the sphere, these both of these are changing, changing, and they're changing both with respect to r, because as I'm moving away from the sphere, I'm getting smaller and smaller uh, in terms of vx and vy components, and the only thing that survives is this vz, this v infinity. Okay? So I have dependence on the distance, for sure, as well as at the angle. Because as I'm moving around to get around the sphere, I gotta change depending on theta. So I cannot get rid of dependence on either r or theta. Okay? And I will assume that my v theta is zero. All right. Well, that should simplify our world somewhat. Okay. So, but and we will actually look into how do equations of motion simplify in a bit. But let's also move and see what are my boundary conditions in this case and how do they translate. So I'm mentioning that one of the boundary conditions is this v infinity, which is in z direction, except that z direction doesn't exist in r theta phi coordinate system, so I've got to translate first, right? So let's do that quickly. So my boundary condition far away from the sphere is that v infinity is equal to v infinity delta z as r tends to infinity. Yeah, that's the formal definition. So how does that translate into spherical conditions, into spherical coordinates? What is my v infinity, which is expressed as v infinity delta z, in spherical coordinates? And to help you out, I'm going to project this again. So something on this slide should help so give it a moment and try to translate. So v infinity is v infinity delta z, and I want that translated into, it's a vector, that vector I can express in any coordinate system I'd like, and I want to express in terms of r, theta, and phi coordinates. What is it? So which part of this you, will you use? 33. 33. So basically the way I like looking at it is how am I going to express actually. So yes, you can, you can try this way or you can basically go directly. I want to express VR, V theta, V phi in terms of X, Y, and Z. So you can actually place it into this. Okay. So basically when I do that, this is what I like. Like I like taking this as a matrix. So all of these coefficients that I shown in a matrix are these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So basically you place them in a matrix and multiply with a vector in x, y, z coordinates. And in x, y, z coordinates, it's a zero, zero, v infinity. Okay. So when you do that, this was a simple vector where you just had delta z, so yes, you could recover things from 33 as well, but this is a more general way. So anytime I have coordinates given in XYZ coordinate system, and I want to translate them to spherical coordinate system, I can use this. So this is the matrix that basically does the transformation between the two coordinate systems. And I have the transpose of it is basically going the other way. Or rather, inverse of it, but inverse and transpose are the same thing for this type of matrix. Because it's, this is this orthonormal. So I don't know if you remember your linear algebra. Maybe you, maybe you don't. <laughs> and it's orthonormal, or it's like that, because both coordinate systems are, or, are uh, the ones with orthogonal coordinates. Okay, so basically then my boundary conditions is that my VR is going to be V infinity cosine theta as R goes to infinity, okay? And my V theta will tend to minus V infinity sine theta as R goes to infinity. Those are the boundary conditions. 
two. Then I will have no slip on the sphere. Okay, what does that mean? So basically I will have and I will have it as one of these tangential velocities on the sphere. We'll, we'll, we'll address the other one uh, in a second, but B theta is zero on R is equal to R. And there is no mass transfer into the sphere. Okay? So nothing is going in our direction either. Okay. So that is so this is tangential. Slip really addresses tangential components and no mass transfer into or out to uh, just uh, addresses normal components to the surface. So basically, both my vr and v theta are zero on the sphere, if sphere is stationary, of course. OK, so those are the boundary conditions. Now, what do equations, one, one thing that I would do is, if I was going to solve this problem, I would take a look at my equations of continuity in motion and throw them into uh, uh, my equations that are expressed in spherical coordinates, and I would basically kill anything related to phi. So essentially, I don't have to look at the phi equation because my v phi is zero. Okay, so that's already solved, and I can place v phi is zero and no dependence of phi into those equations. So let's do that. I have this sentence that the equations are horrendous. Let me prove it to you. Okay, so this is your appendix B6 related to spherical coordinates. So let's look at the R equation. Let's even assume we're looking at steady state. Okay. This disappears, this doesn't, this doesn't, this does because I have D phi here. Okay. So this I can remove, and I can remove this part but not this. That leaves me with this portion here that has both v phi and v, uh, oh, v phi, oh, I can kill this, yeah, I can, this term is already gone. So I have v theta and v r, and I have derivatives with respect to r and theta that I cannot get rid of, okay? Then I look at the second one, isn't that one yummy? What can I remove there? I can remove this if it's a steady state. Um, I can remove this portion because I don't depend on phi. I can remove this part because I don't depend on phi. Okay. And then I can't remove this. This is that part 1 over r square. r square, this comes from divergence and it's basically conserving flux through area that changes as r square. Okay. Um, ba -ba -ba this stays. This can go, this stays, this can go, okay? It still has quite a bit. I have two equations, pretty long, with vr, v theta, partial derivatives of them, even second order, okay, thrown in there. So it's not something that I really have hope to do analytically, okay? Now, what would I do today, okay? Today, I actually have a selection of software. It can be free software. It can be, um, it can be uh, purchased software. So you have open phones, Lattice Boltzmann software that is free. You can have console that is not free. Either way, you actually have at your disposal quite a bit of computational fluid dynamic software libraries that will actually solve this problem. But that's not what they had in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, they had to actually stop and think. Okay? And essentially, Mr. Stokes in 1840 had no computer at hand. He probably didn't even have proper electricity at night to, you know, he had to do it with a candle and all that. And uh, hopefully he had access to enough paper. So <laughs> basically, he basically looked at the problem. And 
One problem that I did, actually didn't mention, I keep mentioning velocities, but there was also pressure in there coupled together with velocities. Okay. So I had Vr, V theta, and P all coupled together in two yummy equations. Okay. So he looked at those equations and tried to eliminate something. Okay. And first thing that you can actually try to eliminate is... Um, pressure. And for that, we actually need the concept of vorticity, which I'm going to introduce here. So, formally, okay, vorticity is the so called curl of the velocity field. So, if I was computing vorticity, then my curl V, and sometimes it will have rotation of V, V will stick mostly to this. To defining this, it, formally you would take a determinant of this. So this would end up being, if I was evaluating this determinant formally, it would be delta x times partial vz partial y minus partial vy partial z. Okay, so these are operators and these are just vectors. Then minus delta y times partial vz partial x minus partial vx partial z and plus delta z times partial vy partial x minus partial vx partial y. Okay, so that would be curl. Okay. Now, what does vorticity measure? It basically measures local tendency locally, if I'm moving with the flow, of the fluid to rotate. So there's a, a rigid rotation that is built in locally. Now, if I actually have P as a scalar field, and that P is gradient, if I'm looking at the curl of a gradient of P, then what happens here? I will have partial, V. can you do that quickly by hand? So replace vx, vy, vz by partial p, partial x, partial p, partial y, and partial z, partial, uh, partial p, partial z. So replace this as gradient of a function and evaluate what is curl of that. So what I'm looking for is what is this and this. And make sure to use the fact that partial derivative with respect to x and y can interchange, right? Or sufficiently smooth functions. So zero. Okay. So now if I remember my equation of motion in vector form, okay, we had rho dv dt where dv dt was material derivative equals to minus grad p minus what what about tau? Minus Divergence of tau, okay, what else? <laughs> and another body force term, right? Okay. So basically, grad P was on its own in that vector equation, and it looks like, if I think about it, if I take curl of that entire equation, the gradient of P would be gone. Okay. Now, that would give me a more complex equation in V, it would actually jump in order, okay? It would be one higher order equation or with the derivatives that are, which are one order higher in velocity, but at least I would 
remove the pressure from the equation. So if you're in 1840, you don't have a computer, you don't even have proper electricity, there's nothing else to do, and in the, or you're attempting to solve this problem, well, you come up with solutions like that, right? <laughs> so folks looked at the problem. So what's the physical meaning of so that's basically a tendency locally. I, I'm actually going to go into that in a moment. That, those are our next slides. But a tendency locally for the velocity field to rotate. Literally rotate. So that means that I have axis of rotation. That, that's why I'm using this. Yeah. So if, I, if you actually look at this equation, let's say that you have a flow that is happening in two dimensions. So it's happening in this plane here, okay? because it's easier to visualize. Then your Vz is zero, okay? And Vx and Vy uh, are not zero. So if you actually do what this is, you will actually see that your vorticity of V, when V is just like Vx, Vy, uh, zero, and you don't have dependence on Z. So wherever you have partial derivative with respect to z, you have nothing. And wherever you have vz, you have nothing. You will get that this is, uh, this is 0, 0. And then the last one is not 0. That's going to be partial vy, partial x minus partial vx, partial y. Okay. So if your vx, vy field, okay, your velocity field, so let's say if this is non-zero, that means that, for instance, I have the way Vy changes with respect to x is slightly larger than the way Vx changes with respect to y. That's this tendency to rotate. Okay? And I will have this, it, my axis of rotation will be pointing in z direction. Because that makes sense for anything in the... 2D plane, if I'm rotating in 2D plane, my axis of rotation has to be in Z. And that's what this shows. So intuitively, again, if I'm a little, a little uneven, <laughs> I'm going to rotate. So I'm going to actually I have a couple of slides to help you intuitively with this. So again, I can eliminate pressure, and that's, we will probably get to this next time, but, but by taking curl of the Navier-Stokes equation, which has that gradient P in there, so I can actually. So I will obtain that way equation of change of vorticity, which is fourth order in velocity, but it doesn't have a pressure term. So that helps me because we will be able, for 2D problems, which are just like this, we will be able to actually solve this equation. So for 2D problems like this, vorticity itself is simple. It has only one coordinate, and that is z. Okay? So we will actually be able to simplify the problem down enough to uh, find the solution. And this process is called stream function solution. Okay? So that's probably we'll get to it on Monday. So let's actually talk about vorticity a little more. So this is a vector, again, that describes local spinning motion of a fluid and while traveling with the fluid, okay? So if you actually look formally, now this is, if this is a little too much math, just ignore me for two moments, but for <laughs> those who can bear this, mathematically, just looking at uh, any kind of nearby point, I can use Taylor's th theorem, and if you remember any theorem from calculus that should likely be Taylor's theorem, this keeps showing up, 1D or multi-D, so basically, I can locally express this as V of x plus, this is my friend Jacobian, okay, applied to this distance, uh, distance vector h, and whatever else is second order term. So when I'm actually looking at this, I can express grad v as this is called symmetric component of the gradient, and this is anti-symmetric. When I sum them up, I'm going to get grad v. So I didn't do anything. Yeah. So basically, this component, you can see that that's my deformation that's, that really, really reminds me of my shear stress. Okay? 
This, so this is translation, okay? This is some deformation, okay? And this part can actually be expressed as a curl with respect to H. So this would be my vorticity curl H. Now, so this is a lot of like just analytical breaking down on my velocity field, but the, again, Every motion, okay, just nearby my point, can be shown to be translation plus deformation, okay, that I have in my fluid that is due to the shear stresses, plus rotation or spinning. So these two are rigid, and this one is the one that only fluids have. So this is just formally I can break down my velocity field to three basic motions that are kind of superimposed. Does that make sense? So even though I arrived at it mathematically, that's something that we often intuitively use. Okay? My motion, however I move to this, from one point to another, it's part translation, part rotation, and part some uh, deformation that is due to shear. Okay? So that is um, mathematically. So again, you can actually show that this, and I, can, I know what Jacobians are, you can actually show that doing this formally is equivalent to this curl, vorticity curl H, okay? If you're so inclined. Or maybe I'll give it as a homework. So again, so this is just to break down any motion, it has that part. So if there is a rotational component to my velocity field, then curl will be non-zero. So when curl V is zero, then we say that flow field means irrotation. So just plain translation, of course, would be irrotational because all the other uh, parts are zero. Okay. Now, if you would like a little exercise. Um, well, let's do it. So if you have constant angular rotation, and let's do it in just 2D, then you're described <coughs> like this. So this is your trajectory. So if this is your trajectory, look at what velocity is and try to take a curl of it. So this is simple rotation. I'm rotating. So x, y changes. Right? And if I have a constant angular velocity, this is my angle changes as this constant angular velocity times time. So this will describe my rotation. So if I'm again moving with constant angular velocity, okay, and this is in z direction is my axis of rotation then I'm expecting the curl of that velocity field should be related to that angular velocity. Okay. And it should be in three directions because I have a two-dimensional motion.
So what is the x dt? So that's my vx, right? So it's minus r. Can I express that in terms of x or y? So this r sine omega t is my y, right? So it's minus omega y. Yes? Now do similar thing for me y. So you have a velocity. Now instead of vx, put here minus omega y. And instead of vy, put omega x. It's going to be omega x. And a zero. Let's see what you get. Zero, zero, 2 omega. So my vorticity is 2 omega delta z. So my axis of rotation is delta z. Of course, if I'm moving in the 2D plane, okay, my axis of rotation should be in z. And I'm related to my. Does that now help you a little visualize what vorticity is? So this is one of the simplest rotation. This is just rotation. It is just rigid rotation. There is nothing else. Okay. Hmm? Well, no, vorticity is a vector. Okay, so it's two omega delta z is your vorticity, because vorticity in itself has also axis of rotation. That's what you got here, right? So, curl of this. Okay, is 2 omega delta z. This is the vorticity. Now, absolute value of vorticity is 1. Curl of velocity is vorticity by definition. So that's what we call vorticity. And it's a vector. Okay. So it's a vector value. And it's equal. Mathematically, this is what it looks like. But I'm trying to build some feeling for it, too, because mathematical part can be a drag. Mathematical part can be a drag, no pun intended. <laughs> OK. All right. So let's actually see this whether this intuition part works. So let's say that you have a small wheel with paddles, and you place it at like points so you, if you place a little wheel, and this is a velocity field kind of enlarged around the blue point, would you rotate? So imagine a little wheel with paddles, and you place it. So would this velocity field rotate it? Yes, it would. So that's where I would have non-zero velocity, a uh, non-zero vorticity. This one? Actually, yeah, I'll get quite a bit. But this one, they kind of like opposite directions cancel each other, so I would be stuck and I would move. Okay? So this is basically vorticity non zero, vorticity non zero, vorticity zero. Okay? So just imagine a little paddle wheel, okay? And would this velocity field rotate it or not? So which fields, there are certain fields that don't have vorticity. Electrostatic field is one of those. And we know that electro the way that there's a force inherent to it, and it's a central type of force. Okay. So I have two bodies, and like if I have a you know, larger charge here and they're attracted, okay, I'm just going to go zoom directly to, the, to this. I'm going to get attracted in a straight line. <laughs> there's no rotation to it. Okay. Or if I'm going to repel, I'm going to get repelled away in a straight line, no rotation to it. So no wheels, no rotations. That, that type of field is um, irrotational. 
And actually, one of the electrostatic, so if you have electrostatic uh, uh, electromagnetics, okay, one of the equations is that curl of electricity field is zero. Okay, so it's irrotational. Now, one, there's also a way to express it as that integral of the field along any closed path is zero. So if I'm moving along the path, and I'm, so basically just like surfaces or integration over surfaces is related to divergence, okay? Integration along the lines is related to curl, to vertices. So some velocity fields, of course, are irrotational as well. Uh, but electrostatic field or some sort of like central type of forces are the types of fields that are non, uh, non, uh, that are irrotational. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. This is just for your information. But basically, the way I would define divergence of a field using line integrals is that you would take small, small sort of like closed curve around the point. You would integrate this field dot tangential vector around that, around that curve. And you would do a line integral and divide it by the area of that uh, enclosed area. And you would send that to zero. Okay? And that's formally normal to that little area dot the vorticity vector. Okay. And there is actually similar version of this uh, for divergence. We didn't go into it. So just to give you a little idea how vorticity is related to line integrals, if this is shooting too high, just ignore it and move on. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to test you on this definition. Uh, so if you do want more additional reading, actually both on divergence and gradients and curl, there's a formal text literally called div grad curl and all that. Okay? So this is just, it's a very good intuitive book on mathematics defined uh, divergence and curl. And we will move on next time uh, with chapter 4.2. Uh, in BSL and stream function approach to solve vorticity equation.